President, uh, please be seated. The court is now in session. Today, the chamber will hear the testimony of a witness through TCW 822 via a video link from Battambong province. Huh? There seems to be a, a technical issue with the translation system. President, let me resume. Today, the chamber will hear the testimony of a witness to TCW 822 via a video link from Battambong province. Ms. Sakobote, please report the attendance of the parties and other individuals at today's proceedings. Mr. President, for today's proceedings, all parties to this case are present, except Mary Giro, the international political lawyer for civil parties, who is absent today and tomorrow due to personal reasons, and Weinberg has been assigned uh, in her place. Council Copper, the defense counsel for Nuji, is also absent uh, today and tomorrow for personal reasons. And Mr. Nuji is present in the holding cell downstairs. He has waived his rights to be present in the courtroom. The waiver has been delivered to the uh, graffier and the witness who is to testify today, that is through TCW 822, will testify via a video link from Battambong province. The witness confirms that through his best knowledge and ability, he has no relationship by blood or by law to any of the two accused, that is Nguyen Chi and Kiu Samporn or to any other civil parties admitted in this case. The witness took an oath this morning and there is no duty counsel assigned to him. President, uh, thank you, Ms. Sekobuti. The chamber now decides on the request by Nguyen Chia. The chamber has received a waiver from uh, Nguyen Chia, dated 7th May 2015, which states that due to his health, that is headache, back pain, he cannot sit or concentrate for long, and in order to effectively participate in future hearings, he requests to waive his right to participate in and be present at the 7th May 2015 hearing. Having seen the medical report of Nguyen Chi by the duty doctor for the accused at the ECCC dated 7th May 2015, who notes that Nguyen Chi has a 
severe back pain and dizziness when he sits for long and recommends that the chambers all grant him his request so that he can follow the proceedings remotely from the holding cell downstairs. Based on the above information and pursuant to Rule 815 of the ECCC internal rules, the chamber grants Nuji his request to follow today's proceedings remotely from the holding cell downstairs via an audio visual means. The AV unit personnel are instructed to link the proceedings to the room downstairs so that he can follow the uh, proceeding remotely, and that applies for the whole day. President and the international co-prosecutor, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, Your Honors. I would like to just bring up one short matter to Your Honors before we begin with the witness, and that is that I'm aware that Your Honors have indicated that you will shortly issue a written decision on the use of evidence that was obtained by torture in this trial. We think that that's an extremely important issue for this court, for this trial, where torture is so at the center of the activities of the Khmer Rouge. And, and also, it's important to the international jurisprudence and to national jurisprudence. Although there have been some filings in the past, that was quite some time ago. And we submit that the court may benefit from hearing from the parties on this issue now my preference, my, my suggestion would be to have an oral hearing for a half hour or an hour where the parties could be heard, or if Your Honors prefer, it could be written. But I think it's a matter of great public interest also, so I think the, an oral hearing would be of great interest to the public. We're, we could do it today, but I notice that several parties are, are missing and perhaps not, don't have notice, so I suggest we do it after the court break. <clears throat> There's a couple of reasons why I think it should go forward. First of all, it's been said in court in the last week a couple of times by the Nunchia defense that they have filed as one of their grounds of appeal in case 2-1 uh, a motion or a request to admit torture-tainted evidence. That's not correct. In their notice of appeal, in the 227 grounds, they have never indicated that was a ground of appeal. They have never requested to amend their notice of appeal. It is correct that they have filed submissions in their written brief on that issue. <clears throat> the co-prosecutors did not respond because it's not one of the grounds of appeal. In the limited pages that we had, we responded to what was grounds of appeal from the notices of appeal of the parties. <clears throat> also, I know that the issue has been coming up a lot with past witnesses in the past few weeks, but I would submit that all of those questions that were asked were improper questions for other reasons. They were irrelevant. So, for example, asking a witness, are you familiar that Chu Chet, in his S-21 confession, implicated you is irrelevant. What does it matter whether the witness is aware of that or not? If the defense wants to ask the witness, were you a CIA, KGB, UN spy, they can ask that question and the witness can answer. There was no reason at this time to go into the issue of these confessions, which the prosecution will continue to submit, cannot be used by the defense to prove the truth of the matter asserted, because to do so, first, they're completely unreliable, and secondly, it encourages torture when you're allowing those who are responsible for the torture to use confessions that they obtained through torture to justify their torture and other killings. So that's my request, is that we have an oral hearing at, after the break on this issue, or if Your Honors prefer, written submissions. Thank you.
President Judge Zamala Vent, you have the floor. Oui, merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Procureur international, est-ce que vous pourriez indiquer à la Chambre de combien de temps vous pensez qu'il serait nécessaire de consacrer à cette question Et si nous avons bien compris, c'est une suggestion que vous, ah, vous n'entendez pas. From President uh, uh, Judge Lavanche, please uh, uh, repeat your question as there is a, a technical issue with the interpretation system. Oui. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question was uh, for the international co prosecutor how much time will be necessary? for uh, this matter regarding the use of evidence that, is li that apparently was obtained under torture. And my second question, are you simply considering a discussion here in the courtroom, or do you also wish to have the possibility of uh, filing written submissions? It might be important for us, especially since the issue might be a bit touchy, that we have an oral discussion as well as written submissions. Thank you. Your Honors, I envisioned an hour or one session for the public hearing, and we would be happy if it's helpful, and I think it might be, to also file written submissions. And just to explain the, the complexity, it is the prosecutor's position that there are many uses of these confessions that are admissible, uh, particularly against the torturers. And further, there's a very delicate question, I think a complex question, of when the court would make a determination that a statement was the product of torture. And we want to submit on that. What, what would be the sequence? President, uh, thank you. The chamber also deems the issue of evidence obtained by torture is of a critical uh, nature. And we actually had uh, quite a long discussion on this issue when Council Copper uh, put a question to the uh, witness in relation to uh, evidence obtained by torture, and the Chamber will consider the uh, proposal by the international co-prosecutor, and we will deliberate uh, the issue amongst ourselves and will inform the parties in due course, and we uh, thank you uh, for that. President, good morning, Mr. Witness. Can you hear me clearly? Witness, yes, I can. President, uh, thank you. And uh, what is your name? My witness, my name is Ai Hoon. President, please uh, repeat your name. Answer, my name is Ai Hoon, says the witness.
President, is it a turn? Answer, yes. And who is Ul Hun? Answer, in fact, uh, Ul uh, is my, fa my grandfather's name and A is my father's name. Question, what is your official name, Mr. Witness? Answer, my official name is A Hun. However, sometimes uh, the register did not uh, ask me and uh, used Ul Hun for my name. President, that clears the matter. Then let me uh, stick to your official name, that is uh, A Hun. And when were you born, Mr. A Hun? Answer, no, I cannot recall my date of birth. I only recall that during the time uh, I was born and when I grew up, it was the uh, war time around the Isra uh, era. Question, what is your age now? Answer, I am 78 now. Thank you. Question, where is your place of birth? Answer. When I was young, I lived in Tropeng Prey Village, Tropeng Thum, Kantabong Commune, Tramco District, Takai Province. Thank you. Question. Where is your current address? Answer. At present, I live in Tasang Village, Tasang Commune, Sumlo District, Badambong Province. Thank you. And what is your current occupation? Answer. I am elderly. I cannot do anything but my children work in the farm. Thank you. And can you tell us the, the names of your father and mother? Answer. Ul A is my father's name, and Nam Hong is my uh, mother's name. She was uh, Vietnamese from Krobao Motru, Kampuchee Crown. Thank you. And what is your wife's name? And how many children do you have together? Answer. My wife's name is Chia Ni, and we have six children. Ai Thun, Ai Khun, Ai Bun, Ai Won, Ai No, and Ai Non. One of them died. President, thank you, Mr. Aihun. The graffier made an oral report that, to your best knowledge, none of your father, mother, ascendants, children or descendants, brothers, sisters, in-laws, or wife is admitted as a civil party in case 002. Is that information correct? Answer, that is not true. Samnang, do you uh, understand the charge question? Witness, uh, Mr. President, please repeat your question as uh, it is unclear to me, uh, President. Uh, Mr. Aihun, to your best knowledge, do you know if any of your father, mother, ascendants, children or descendants, brothers, sisters, in-laws or wife is admitted as a civil party in case 002? Answer, yes, uh, that is correct. Question, and that you already took an oath before your testimony, is that correct? And said yes.
President, the Chamber would like to inform you of your rights and obligations as a witness regarding your rights. As a witness in the proceedings before the Chamber, you may refuse to respond to any question or to make any comment which may incriminate you. That is your right against self-incrimination. This means that you may refuse to provide your response or make any comments that could lead you to being prosecuted and on your obligations. As a witness in the proceedings before the chamber, you must respond to any questions by the bench or relevant parties except where your response or comments to those questions may incriminate you And as a witness, you must tell the truth that you have known, heard, seen, remembered, experienced, or observed directly in relation to any occurrence or event relevant to the questions that the bench or the parties pose to you. And do you understand about the rights and obligations that I just read out? Witness, yes, I do. President, uh, thank you. Have you been interviewed by investigators of the Office of the Co-Investigating uh, Judges? Answer, yes, I have been interviewed uh, twice, although I cannot recall the dates. President, thank you. And before your appearance today, have you reviewed your previous uh, interviews in order to refresh your memory? Answer, yes, I have uh, read them all. Question, can you tell the chamber whether the uh, statements in the written records of your interviews are consistent with your words that you gave to the investigators? Answer. Yes, they are consistent uh, with what I uh, told them during the uh, two interviews. President, uh, thank you. And uh, pursuant to Rule 91B of the ECCC Internal Rules, the co-prosecutors will be given the floor first uh, to put questions to this witness. And the uh, total time for the co-prosecutors and the lead co-lawyers is one full day. And the uh, chamber would like uh, to inform the parties that Mr. Ulhun has uh, some issues uh, concerning his health. For that reason, uh, please uh, try to uh, make uh, your questions short and precise. And the chamber trusts that the parties uh, will uh, take uh, this uh, information and uh, Put your questions accordingly. And now the co-prosecutors, you have the floor. Merci, bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. President, your honors, and all the parties. Mr. Witness, my name is Vincent de Wild. I will put questions to you on behalf of the Office of the Co-Prosecutors this morning and this afternoon. I would like to start by thanking you for appearing before us in spite of your ailing condition. And when I put questions to you, may I request you to tell me wh whether or not the questions are clear if you do not understand the question. If you do not understand the answer to a question, please do not invent an answer or to speculate, but simply say that you do not know. I'll start with a few questions regarding your family so that we may know what your origins are.
you said in the background information that your mother was Vietnamese from Kampuchea Krom. If I properly understood what you told DC Com, we have a document whose reference is E three zero five slash one three point two three point four five one. I'll give the ERN numbers as well. In Khmer, it is 0096-8886. In French, 0105-3707. And in English, 0105-0180. This is what you told the the investigators from the Cambodian Documentation Center. You said, my grandmother was from Vietnam. My mother was born in Cambodia. My grandfather did not speak Khmer and married my grandmother who spoke Khmer but not Vietnamese. My grandfather was a native Vietnamese. He was born in Chao Doc, also known as Krabao Mot Truk province in Vietnam. Is this correct? Does it reflect your origins on your mother's side? Mr. Timon? Mr. Witness, can you hear me? I was asking you whether what I had read out to you was correct. That is, your, did your grandmother hail from Vietnam and your mother, was she born in Cambodia? And I also asked whether the father of your mother was a native Vietnamese. Is all this information correct? <laughs> Answer, yes, that is correct. You described your mother as a Vietnamese from Kampuchea Krom. Can you assist us in enabling us to understand this? When you talk of Khmer Krom, what precisely do you mean? Because sometimes there's a mix-up mix up between Vietnamese settling or who settled in Kampuchea Krom but who did not speak Khmer properly, but th and those who were in Kampuchea Krom and spoke Khmer. Can you tell us what is the distinction between Khmer Krom, native Vietnamese, and Vietnamese from Cambodia, and so on and so forth? Answer. It is not clear because my grandfather who was called Nang who came to settle in Cambodia did not speak Khmer. I do not know whether he was Khmer Krom or Vietnamese. But he spoke Vietnamese and my grandmother spoke Vietnamese a little bit as well. And uh, my mother, that is their daughter, also spoke a bit of Vietnamese. Uh, his younger brother was born in Krabao. He, he spoke uh, Vietnamese and served as an interpreter for family members. So all I can say quite simply is that it is very unclear because I myself never went to Krabao or to Chao Doc. So I saw my family members that is all. Very well. You also made some statements in the record of our interview, E319.1.31, that is your first record of interview. And you said in answer to question 11, that is answer 11, my 
My, mo my father was a village chief during the Sankum Rias Riyum era because my father had been a village chief and my m mother was Vietnamese. They wanted to purge. He said, your family was accused of having undesirable tendencies. That is, I joined the revolution, but my father was accused of having uh, unpleasant tendencies. So your mother was Vietnamese, and your father had played a role in the previous regime, and you were accused of having undesirable tendencies. What do you mean by undesirable tendencies? Answer? I haven't quite understood your question. Please repeat it. Prosecutor, I will simplify it. You said your father was a village chief under the Sianuk uh, regime, that is in the Sianuk era. And you said your mother was Vietnamese and your family was purged because they had undesirable tendencies. Did they say that your family had undesirable tendencies because of the nationality of your mother and the, uh, that of your father as well? No. Answer, yes, that is indeed the case. Toujours concernant votre famille, Pourriez-vous nous dire quel était le lien qui vous unissait à Tachim, le chef adjoint du district en 1975 Est-ce qu'il y avait un lien familial avec, avec vous Vous avez dit qu'il y avait des liens familiales entre votre famille et Tachim, qui était le district chief, le député du district chief, je vous remercie. Réponse wife was Sino Khmer and the mother of my wife was also Sino Khmer. The father was Cambodian and that is why I call them Sino Khmer. Let me rephrase my question because I think it was not well understood. I talked about family ties that you could have with Tachim, C-H-I-M, the deputy chief of Tramkak district in 1975, also known as Pechim. Answer. Tachim was my cousin and also my brother-in-law. Thank you. How about Sam Don, alias Don, from the district office? Was he also your cousin? Yes. Can you tell us what were the positions of two of your brothers, Hin, H E N G, which or, or whom you refer to as the great Khmer Rouge army chief. Answer. In 1976, Heng was appointed district chief and he took over from Tassan. Are you not mixing him up with your elder brother Yao? Why A E V? You said that he took over directly from Tassan. Are you not mixing up Yao and Heng?
answer. I do not quite understand your question. Please repeat it. I'll try to jog your memory with what you said. You made mention of two brothers. I believe that was before CD come. You talked of a brother called Heng, H E N G. You said he was a Khmer Rouge army chief, and you said he died in 1973. You also made mention of another brother, Yao, Y A E V, who was deputy district head at Ko Andet district from 1977 to, to 1978. Is that correct? Answer, that is correct. Mr. Witness, wait a minute. Council Kong Sang On, you have the floor. Kong Sang On. Thank you, Mr. President. May I ask the international co-prosecutor to specify the passage in which the names Heng and Yao are found. That is the CDK, a uh, CDCAM document. You are right. It is E305 slash 13.23.451. In French, the ERN is 01053714. In Khmer, it is 00968891, towards the end of the page. And in English, 0105 01 Witness, given your family ties with Tachim and Sam Don, and also given the fact that your brother had held positions in the regime, did you enjoy some protection in spite of the fact that your family had undesirable tendencies? Answer? My elder brother's Heng died in 1973, and Yao lived far off. He could not assist me. So it was only Tachim who could assist me. That was my brother-in-law. He was able to rescue me from the clause of the EACOM. Question, can you remind us of what you did between 1974 and 1975? Did you have any duties and responsibilities in the village and in your cooperative at the time? Answer, I was appointed group leader, and after the classes were established, I was crushed by the wheels of history, and I was uh, dismissed from my position. Question. Did Tachim at any point in time assist you to be reinstated at any position in Tramkok district? Answer, yes. Uh, he protected me from Yekom, 
So he hit me in the district office where I was in charge of on, of loading rice and uh, salt trucks. Let me ask you for the exact date on which you returned to the district office. You said to DC come and the Khmer page is 0096-8888 in French, 0105-3710, and in English, 0105-0182. This is a question that was put to you. Up until when were you deputy chief of the village? And your answer was, uh, I was village chief up to 1975 when the entire country was liberated. They then asked me to work in the district office. And a little further on, you say that I was appointed on the very day the country was liberated. And of quote, free translation. Question, did you start working in the district office as you pointed out on the very day um, Dakel was captured in April 1975? Answer. After the war ended, that is in April, Tachim came and took me in order that I would guard his house. And then he assigned me to work in the district office. You pointed out to the co-investigating judges, if I am not mistaken, that you left the Tramka district office in late 1978 in order to join Pechim in Kampong Cham. Can you tell us the exact period, the month, in which you left the Tramka district? Answer. I was afraid of Tassin. He wanted to kill me at the time. He needed 200 inhabitants in order to bring them to Kampong Cham, and I requested to be allowed to go, and they said no. And when the truck was going to leave, I jumped into the truck. That was in August 1977. So it was on that date that I went to Kampong Cham, that is the East Zone. Are you sure that it was in 1977? Because I believe you said on several occasions, 1978, in your previous statements, was that several months before the Vietnamese arrived, or only a few months before they arrived, or more than a year before they arrived? Answer. I left Tramcock District in August 1977, and that was only um, at the end of a period of a few months in Kampong Cham that the Vietnamese entered Cambodia. Very well, says the prosecutor. The Vietnamese entered Cambodia in early January 1978. Do you therefore confirm that that was a few months before you jumped into that truck to go to Kampong Cham? Let me uh, repeat the question. I said that the Vietnamese came in early January 1979, not 78. 
So did you leave a few months before the Vietnamese arrived in Cambodia? I left in August and on the 31st of December, the Vietnamese attacked the uh, uh, tube plantation office and from that date I sought refuge in the forest. Very well, you started working in the district office shortly after Phnom Penh was captured and you left that office to go to Kampong Cham approximately three and a half years later. Can you tell us what your last position was in the Tramcup district office? You stated that you distributed bags of salt and rice. Did you continue doing so during the entire period of more than three years or you had other duties and responsibilities in that office? Answer. In 1975, all I did was offload trucks of uh, rice and salt. Uh, uh, and at times, I offloaded about 30 bags of rice. One bag was about 100 kilograms. And when they wanted to kill me, touch him, hit me. And I worked in the surveys department. In 1978, touch him. Kim wanted to kill me, and I fled during that period. So if I understood your testimony correctly, you worked, first of all, of loading bags of rice and salt up until the time when Ye Kom left. Is that correct? You told C.D. Kam that you left in 1976. Answer yes. Question. And when were you in charge of the surveys department, that is the registry, within that office? From what time and up until when? Answer. I was in the registry department. All I did was to carry poles from 1976 to 1978, and thereafter I left with Tachin. So I worked there for three years. Yes, says the prosecutor. Let me read out to you what you told uh, DC Cam, and the comment page is 096 8897. In French, 01. 053719 and in English 01050188. You stated the following, and I quote I was indeed a member in charge of the registry in 1976. Uh, from 1976 up to 1978 when I went to the Chup rubber plantations. When you state that you became a member, do you mean you are an official member of the district office or quite simply someone who was working there in charge of the registry, the registers or book, bookkeeping? Answer. I was not in charge of bookkeeping. All I did was to carry stuff, so I used my hands and my strength. Were you able to find out during that period, period since you were still working in the district office, what was the role of that office 
in terms of commerce and economic affairs? Answer. From 1975 to 1976, China granted uh, food aid, mainly rice, to Cambodia, and I transported the food to the provinces. Tamok distributed the rice and other supplies uh, everywhere in the district. Since he was the regional chief, he was in charge of distribution, and the chief of the sectors asked the district chiefs to come and fetch the bags of rice. So trucks of rice were collected and distributed to the new people, and uh, I had to load the bags of rice onto the trucks alone. That was very hard work. Question. Did the district office also play any role in security affairs? Was it the district office that was in charge of the militias at the level of the district? Answer, no. The district office had its own task and I had nothing to do with security. I'm not speaking about you. I'm not saying that you had a role in terms of security. I'm only asking if at the district office there was a section, a unit, that was in charge of the district security and in particular in charge of the militiamen and of the district army. Are you aware uh, of this or not? Answer. Come would receive orders from the province and he would then pass on uh, the orders to the lower levels. So you're speaking here about uh, orders in terms of uh, security, so the w which come would receive uh, from the provincial level, is that the case? Uh, as for the uh, security matters, people who were arrested and uh, as they were accused of having uh, different political uh, tendencies or whether they were accused as CIA spies, then they would be sent to uh, Yekom and if the Kong was not there, Tachim would be the representative. As for Tachai, Tachai was not uh, dealing with uh, this matter. So the uh, security uh, matters uh, were the responsibilities of the Kong and Tachim, and Tachim had his own uh, team of a security uh, force. And the same thing applies to uh, the Kong as he had a group of security force who would uh, be there to uh, received the people who had been arrested. Fine, we will get back to this a little bit later. I have a few names <clears throat> to run by you, people who allegedly worked at the district office in uh, different units. Can you first of all speak to us about the role that your cousin Sondorn played? What was his exact position, what would he do on a day-to-day -day basis? Don was my cousin. He was in charge of uh, bookkeeping. For example, if Tamok uh, needed a certain uh, number of uh, forces, then Don would uh, go to the villages to get uh, those uh, people and Sam Bourne was also in charge of uh, materials and uh, logistics as he was in charge of overall bookkeeping. Uh, 
was he the head of the district office or was he working in another office? Man. Some don't work in the district office on a daily basis as he had to be there to receive materials uh, sent from the provincial office or from uh, Tamok, and then he will distribute uh, them uh, further down. And he was the one who was there to uh, keep the uh, to do the bookkeeping or to make any uh, request to the upper echelon for further materials or tools. And does the name the name P mean something to you? Apparently, he worked at the district office, and he had problems walking. Yes, I know P very clearly. During the nineteen uh, seventy, nineteen seventy, P was the uh, messenger of the gym. And later on, he was assigned to District 107. And later on, people took revenge against him, and he was uh, killed by the villagers. But did he work at the Tramkak district office, in particular with uh, secure in security matters? No, he did not. He was not in charge of the district office. Fine. That was not my question. What I asked you was, did he work at the district office or in one of the offices that was nearby? And did he have any position with regard to the militiamen or with regard to the security uh, center in the region? He never sold himself in the district office. He was at a logistic office to the west of the pagoda as he was assigned by the sector to be in charge of that uh, warehouse. And later on, uh, the chairman assigns him to be the district chief of uh, District 107, if my recollection is uh, good. Did you know someone by the name of Wu? L-U-O-S or H, who apparently was a militiaman there. Man. It was a Ruh. Ruh was uh, very close to uh, Ye Kom, and he was uh, in dealing with the arrest. And in 1979, when the Vietnamese entered uh, Cambodia, he was killed by the angry villagers. And does the name Khom, K-H-O-R-M, ring a bell? And did this person play a role that was uh, similar to O's? No, I uh, can you please uh, pronounce the name again? Yes, I will try. Corn. My colleague says I pronounced it pretty much right. K H O R M. Corn. Corn. Uh, corn was a man. I did not know what problems he had, but he was uh, uh, transferred to be to work in the uh, district office, and he was in charge of the uh, repairment.
And finally, a uh, last person by the name of Duch, <coughs> D-U-C-H. His real name was Ip Duch. Did this person work at the district office or uh, at the district committee? No. Duch Elis Saim never worked in the district office. He worked with the uh, Tapi at his uh, Tapi's uh, office, and later on, he was transferred uh, to the East Zone. I'm not sure we're speaking about the same Duke. I'm speaking about someone who had uh, a position uh, with regard to the district youth. So do you know uh, any a Duch who held responsibilities uh, with regard to the youth. It was Ron who was in charge of the, the youth, and uh, Ron is still alive. Uh, as for Deutsch, Deutsch stayed uh, always with the P. Fine. Do you know if... Um, these different people, and in particular Wu, Korn, and Duch, or P, would sometimes go to Krang Takchan. Did you ever, were you ever informed of this when you worked at the district office? In 1978, probably in August 78, I did not know that Kantachan uh, office existed. However, only later, maybe in the year 2000, says the witness, I uh, was told that uh, Kantachan office existed a long time ago and there were many skeleton remains there. Fine. Uh, maybe two last questions before the break, uh, witness. Uh, was there someone at the district office who somehow was uh, a greffier, someone who would take notes, who would, was in charge of uh, archives, of the registers, uh, of the population lists, and that kind of thing? After some dawn, Ta Chim and Ta Chai had left. There was another uh, graphie by the name of U Jain, who uh, finished uh, year 12 in the previous uh, education system. And uh, when the Vietnamese arrived, uh, he fled somewhere. But later on, uh, I, I met him, and I believe he is still alive. In his office, this Uchem, would he keep lists of 17 April families and lists of base people in order to know who was living within the district? Bun Jain, who did the secretarial work, was in charge of all those uh, bookkeepings in terms of expenditure. Uh, the list of uh, people who came to the area from outside, or whether people of uh, whether a number of forces had to be sent uh, to other areas, he would also maintain that list. President, thank you. It is now convenient for a short break. We'll take a break now and resume at 10.30. And Mr. Ai uh, we, we have a short break now, and uh, we will resume at 10.30. You may also rest. <laughs> Some Jane Groucho.